we should. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to um, uh, I'm, I'm going to mute myself, and I'm going to I right now I'm going to start webinar, and that will allow people to come in. Okay. Yeah. Everything. You haven't have any other questions, George? No, it's all good. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I'm going to start webinar. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I'll start out by just giving a few words about who we are. We are CARP Ottawa's Advocacy Working Group on Long-Term Care, uh, with members from Brantford and Niagara. And over the last three years, we've been working with CARP National, CARP chapters in Ontario, as well as other like-minded organizations to bring attention to the dire need to change the way care is delivered in our long-term care homes. We consider ourselves to be champions of emotion-based care and our goal continues to be a transformative change from a task-based to an emotion-based model of care in Ontario's long-term care homes. Emotion-based care exists in an environment that is warm, caring, and feels like home is where staff truly know their residents, their families, and understand their lived experiences. And it's where schedules and routines match residents' preferences and needs, and where meaningful activities engage residents according to their abilities and what brings them joy. And where relationships thrive between and amongst staff, residents, and families. Now, if this sounds like a pipe dream to you, it's not. Change is happening right now, right here, as we are seeing a growing number of these models being implemented in Ontario and elsewhere in Canada, albeit at a painfully slow pace. Most of these homes are based on the four emotion-based models that we know of so far that have existed in other countries across the world and that have experienced better outcomes both pre and during COVID. These are the Eden Alternative, the Greenhouse Project, the Butterfly Model, and the Hojue Villages. And we know the City of Toronto is implementing a hybrid model called CARE-TO in their 10 municipal homes. And there are a few homes in Ottawa and elsewhere working on similar philosophies of care. So we want to start a conversation about the positive opportunities that exist in long-term care homes today for the first time in almost four decades. Please be a part of this conversation and we ask you to visit our website at www.changeltcnow.ca and share this information with your friends, families and colleagues. So now just a few uh, housekeeping points uh, before I introduce Dr. Heckman. Uh, Dr. Heckman will speak for about 30 to 35 minutes there will then be 15 minutes for questions and answers. And we ask that you put all your questions into the chat box 
and Marg will direct as many as possible to Dr. Heckman uh, after his presentation uh, has been completed. And as you saw when you entered the webinar, it will be recorded. And now I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Heckman. Dr. Heckman has an undergraduate degree in engineering physics, a master's degree in mathematics and computer science, and then completed his Doctor of Medicine in 1995 at the University of Toronto. Quite a diversified background there. <laughs> He's a geriatrician and currently the Schlegel Research Chair for Geriatric Medicine at the University of Waterloo. When I looked online at uh, looking for some information on Dr. Heckman, uh, I realized it could take the rest of our webinar listing all the current work and accomplishments. So suffice it to say, we are very lucky he's interested in long-term care homes. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Heckman, and now over to you. I'm so sorry that I've been so hard to research. <laughs> it's a, it's a, I'm teaching a course right now and uh, in gerontology, I have 375 students and about so far up to 45 had had influenza in the last four weeks. So teaching is a complete gong show this fall and um <laughs> anyway so yes i i'm also known locally at my with respect to what my children think as a bit of a nerd and i should have stopped going to school a long time ago so i'm going to share my screen now and um talk about this because this is this is very important i hope you can see the main screen. Are, are, are you seeing the main screen or are you seeing the speaker slides? I think it's the main screen. Okay, good. All right. It's not full screen though. Is it supposed to be full screen? It should be, yeah. Let me try that again. It's only been three years of Zoom <laughs> and trying to do this, but it might work now. How's that? That's better. Yes. Okay, good. All right. So uh, the last three years have been obviously very um, momentous for the entire healthcare system, long term care in particular. Uh, I'm a consultant, I'm a geriatrician, um, and I'm medical director for a retirement home. And I also do consultative work for another local uh, long term care home. So I'm in the uh, in the system from that perspective. And I've been doing my research on that for 20 years or so. And uh, just a couple of disclosures. Uh, the Schlegel chair is not associated with Schlegel villages. It's basically the Schlegel family gave money to the university and uh, I'm funded through that means. And uh, I don't have to report to uh, the nursing home side of things, just so people know that ahead of time. Um, research funding throughout my life from a variety of uh, settings, including public health um, in Canada and um, fellow of Interi Canada, although I won't be speaking very much about Interi today. I want to start with a story from long-term care um, based from my practice working on a memory care floor. And then I want to talk about, you know, what is long-term care and, and maybe try to take a step back um, because I think we're talking about culture change at the long-term care level, but one can argue that until the healthcare system itself respects the individual better than it does now, and, and doesn't necessarily pigeonhole people into certain institution based on some fairly arbitrary criteria, we're not gonna have true culture change uh, if, if the rest of the system doesn't follow suit. So this is a story of a resident that I saw um, a couple of years ago before the pandemic. Um, B, uh, BC before COVID and uh, she was 84 and she was on a memory care unit in a long-term care home and and uh, she had a mixed dementia but could not really express herself verbally very much and after lunch she would walk back with her walker from the dining room and and as soon as she saw an open door she would go into that room it wasn't hers um, and she would sit on the bed and, and sometimes the bed had somebody in it, 
And sometimes after her meals, her bowels would go and she would urinate or defecate on the occupant of the bed. And obviously that's a problem. And um, the physician um, prescribed a sedative really not knowing what to do and, and uh, I got involved. And I'm just gonna pause here to see if anyone here has any comments or thoughts about this. I want this to be interactive. Either type it on the chat or blurt it out. Yeah, I'm not sure they can speak, but okay. Cheryl, you can jump in here. <laughs> there don't se doesn't seem to be any questions on the chat box yet. Okay. Keep this in mind, right? We'll keep going because obviously this is a problem. And, um, you know, what do we do about it? And is a sedative the right thing to do? So let's think about long term care in Canada. And, and this is more recent uh, data from StatsCan uh, about the long term care situation across the country. And essentially, the, the idea of long term care is it's a congregate setting that offers 24-hour care to people who are no longer able to be independent in the community. And we'll talk about that because that's really important here. Um, it is generally publicly funded. Uh, there are for-profit, charitable, not-for-profit operators, uh, but generally the bulk of the funding is comes from subsidies, mainly by ministries of health, but other uh, areas, charities and municipal homes. Uh, over 2,000 homes in the country, 200,000 beds, and of course, as their population ages, the, the proportion of people who might qualify for this is going to continue skyrocketing. Look at the Ontario admission criteria from the website of the Ministry of Health. Quote, unquote, complex problems, including challenging behavior, physical disability combined with cognitive impairment or impairments in multiple areas of function that have a pronounced impact on ability to be independent, and including physical disability, cognitive impairment, falls, challenging behavior, and wandering. So it sounds complicated. Um, when we look at data, um, then we, we can focus in a little bit on, on what that actually means in terms of the numbers. So these are old data from before 2010. Uh, the paper hasn't been updated, but it shows, except for Quebec, essentially the demographics and the health issues faced by people in long-term care homes across the country. And, and obviously, mainly women. Women live longer than men and generally older. And, and the age since then has gotten much older. In fact, in the retirement home where I work, uh, I regularly look after people in their 90s and they're not even long-term care level. Uh, dementia is very prominent, obviously, and cognitive impairment as well, but certainly not the majority. But you know, in Ontario, at least 56, 60% have a formal diagnosis, but there's a lot of other stuff going on. So heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, people with active cancer, a lot of stroke, a lot of mental health. So when they're talking about complexity, this is what they mean. When we look at cognitive impairments, these are basically standardized assessments that are routinely done in, in long-term care homes across the country, again, except Quebec. Um, is it basically, at most, mild cognitive impairment affects 30% of folks, but most people have at least some moderate to more severe degree of cognitive impairment. Most people have significant requirements with basic activities of daily living. So bathing, showering, dressing, mobility, a high burden of mood, a lot of expressions. I don't like the term behavior, but expressions, a fair bit of unstable health, a lot of pain, right? So that complexity, if we, if we think about it in a more granular way, it is, it is overwhelming to think about. And when we think of what happens to them, these are data from a study that we did in Alberta, British Columbia, and Ontario, looking at these data, is that uh, when people come into long-term care, there's a high risk of being hospitalized in the first year, and there's a high risk of death in the first year. 
And in fact, most people are in long-term care homes for about 18 months to two years maximum. So complexity, a lot of health service utilization, most people are at the end of life. And then COVID hit. And, and the really important part about COVID, as we've heard, is the, they were hit very, very hard. Right? Uh, P, PPE, protective equipment, was an afterthought in long-term care. But once it came on board, what was interesting is, is the whole idea of what we're talking about today, which is culture change and person-centeredness, went out the window as we started focusing on infection control. And we can talk about why that would be, but uh, this has been a setback. We've seen an increase in the use of antipsychotic drugs in long-term care residents. Although some of the work that we're doing right now does suggest that a fair proportion of that actually comes from hospitals. And so people are being hospitalized with antipsychotics. Be that as it may, again, the brunt of the impact of the pandemic was on long-term care residents, be it direct more deaths or, or indirect consequences of, of isolation. And really the question that I want to think about is what is long-term care? Is it housing? And I think we'll agree that it is a form of housing. Uh, it's also a place where healthcare is received or delivered. Uh, again, dementia, but chronic disease is prominent, as is disability. And it's important to think of these things as we move along this conversation about what it is that we want long-term care to become. And as you, as you basically talked about, the, the whole idea of moving from the institutional approach to uh, more person holistic, person-centered and holistic care. So why is it that we are where we're at? Uh, all of this began in the 16, 1700s, where these so-called alms houses were created for anyone who didn't have a home, essentially poor, orphans, people with mental health problems, alcoholics, often supported by the church or a charity. And, and each village, each little town had one of these alms houses. In the 1800s, uh, people, again, for probably non-person-centered reasons, did not like being housed with persons with chronic mental health issues and alcohol and addictions, and, and they had more means. And so they decided that they would prefer to live in, in an institution called an old age home. And that's where we started seeing a little bit the conversion to more of the institutional approach. In the early 1900s, many uh, democracies um, started to have social programs to provide income for retired persons or older persons who you know, had lost their sources of income. And that became an opportunity for these institutions to now start making money and start charging. And that's where we really saw the expansion of the long-term care sector, if you want to call it an industry. Uh, and as well as government oversight. So you had this relationship where funding came from government to the long-term care homes, and, and therefore there was an exchange of money, and that sort of opened up the, the whole long-term care sector and led to a boom. Um, however, government oversight did not come overnight, and what happened is many of these places took the money but did not provide adequate health care for a, a population that was getting older and more vulnerable. And so eventually um, the focus went from housing to healthcare. And in the US Medicaid basically started to fund these places and, and you, you ended up entrenching these homes and institutions into more healthcare providing sectors like a hospital, which is obviously what we're talking about today. You know, People in the 1980s said, this is no good. I don't want to live out my days in a hospital. I want to live in what looks like a home sector and I want to be cared for as an individual. And, and I won't reiterate what you just said before in the introduction is basically what we're interested in here is transforming this into more relationship approach to care. Small home-like environments, eight to 16 residents per unit is the ideal and we'll see why that is. Everyone has to be committed to doing this. Staff has to be sufficient and well-paid and, and focus on the empathy, right? And person-centered, basically meaning that we recognize the resident and the families as integral members of the team and their goals and wishes are what we are here to support. 
Now, how we define that, we'll have to talk about that because obviously we're looking at people who have cognitive impairment, chronic illnesses, disabilities, and, and yet want to live out their lives in a home-like environment. They need a purpose. They want a purpose. They want to have relationships. And again, all of this must be person-centered. I think it's important to talk about terminology here. And so there's a recent article in the Canadian Journal on Aging that looked at the impact of the pandemic on, uh, on, on culture change in general in, in, in Canada. And I can send a link to that. It's a very interesting paper, but they do talk about the issue of terminology. And so the overarching term of person-centeredness means that the resident is supported to inactive decision-making and participation in their care care writ large, not just the medical care, but overall what happens to them. They are the masters, they are in the driver's seat. Their goals and needs are central. Relationship-centered care really focuses on the quality of the relationships between the person and their family and the tech care team. And, and it is understood that the better the relationships are, the better person-centered care can be delivered. And then there's the term patient-centered, which is more restricted in its focus to medical care. And really the overarching term that really we, we want to think about is person-centeredness. So there, there are models. There have been models since the 1980s. People have been trying to change the way that long-term care homes operate for the betterment of the quality of life. And, and, and high quality data are basically lacking. Unfortunately, uh, the most abundant data is, is from the US. Uh, Dave Grabowski is a PhD trained health services researcher, and he's done a lot of work with another group uh, to look at mainly the greenhouse model. And what they show is essentially culture change focusing on greenhouse model in particular leads to fewer health-related citations. So we know the government is there to inspect complaints. Well, if you, if you do this kind of work, you're gonna get fewer complaints. And that's okay, that's, that's not bad. But what we do know is that quality of life is improved, resident satisfaction is improved, and resident autonomy is improved. This is in general for culture change models. Greenhouse itself, as I mentioned, has more evidence behind it. It does tend to cost more, but I think, you know, we'll talk about the cost because we're, we are skimping in Ontario on staffing. And so higher costs, sure, but, you know, we do need to have better staffing models, better staff retention, but these folks are less likely to be hospitalized. And, and, and while that's not a necessarily a quality of life measurement, I think most people will agree that they don't wanna to go to a hospital and avoid it because when you are in a long-term care setting and you go to a hospital, we've recently published on that, you come back worse off and costing the system more. So the other thing is better staff retention, better resident quality of life. And more recently, what was shown during the pandemic is because of the small size of these homes, and the regular staffing and the ability of people to have a nice room and by themselves. So as opposed to a small single bed place with very little and very little, very few things to do, um, go, going to your hall, you, to your room because you have symptoms isn't as bad. You're still part of the, the family. You're still part of the, uh, the group here. And so they had an 80% lower COVID mortality rate. And that is the important part here. You can achieve culture change and achieve good infection control if you have, if you adhere to the principles of, of culture change. And specifically in this situation, more staff, more constant staff, smaller, smaller units. But there remain challenges, and I think let's go through these challenges, because as you mentioned in your introduction, change is coming painfully slowly. Right? You've, got, you've cited some homes where things are changing, but we have 700 homes in Ontario, and we have a really long way to go. And, and let's look at the main thing that's been in the media is the issue of for-profit and not-for-profit. And when one looks at systematic reviews, and other studies that look at resident outcomes, not-for-profit homes are on average generally better than for-profit homes. 
fewer pressure ulcers, less physical restraints, and again, fewer deficiencies in governmental assessments. You know, that, that probably does correlate to the quality of care. But there's a lot of heterogeneity here. And what does that mean? It, it basically means that some, and probably if a large number of for-profit homes actually do good work, right? Um, and, and other municipal or charitable homes don't do as good work. And, and, and I think we need to step back because when you see a lot of heterogeneity in results, I mean, it tells you that there's something else going on here, that this is not the main driver of the outcomes. We heard from Nathan Stahl's work uh, in the first couple of waves of the pandemic, the impact of ownership on uh, long-term care deaths. And there was a significant relationship here in terms of ownership models and long-term care deaths. But the issue really was the age of the nursing homes. So we see here in terms of the, uh, the mortality for profit homes at higher mortality, but when you adjust for the age of the nursing homes, uh, that relationship was minimized. And really, we're talking about old facilities that were being purchased by chains, and these old facilities are the old institutional models. And so, viruses love crowding and poor air conditioning, and essentially, this is what happened. And now, for some reason, I cannot move my slide ahead my my mouse does not go all right we'll do this this is again taken from nathan Stahl's study and it looks at the uh, proportion of residents who died of covid and it just shows you the high overlap so you can see that in the for profit homes there are uh, homes that had higher mortality rates and in municipal homes, most of them had lower mortality rates, but you see there's a very substantial overlap there. And that means there's other things going on that we have to think about. So overall outcomes are worse in for-profit homes, often driven by facility age and chain status, okay? Uh, and we also know that municipal homes do get extra funding. Uh, the Ministry of Health is, is looking at this, but we're looking at an extra 15 to 20,000 per resident per year. And that's mainly because municipal homes fall under municipal collective agreements and healthcare providers in these are generally better paid. So there's that aspect of it, which begs the question is why are municipalities funding healthcare in Ontario when really is this not a provincial jurisdiction? But as I mentioned, there's other stuff going on. And, and let's face it, <clears throat> physicians are not trained in geriatrics. In fact, for long-term care medical directors, mandatory training has only been introduced and, and is being grandfathered. And, and you can still practice right now in, in November 2022 as a medical director without having done the medical director course out of Baycrest. Um, specialists do not support long-term care a lot. So psychiatry perhaps, but geriatricians spend very little time uh, and general internists and cardiologists even less. And so we do know from the literature that when specialists come and support long-term care teams, you get better outcomes. Inadequate geri training, geriatric training across the whole board. You know, I've had some RPNs have no idea what heart failure was, no idea. And, and, and so we, you know, we do teaching at the bedside and we try to cover up these deficits, but you know, we have an issue with training. Overregulation still prevalent. We, we have a Ministry of Health, and again, we've seen the punitive aspects of the regulatory framework where Val must do this and must do that. And the regulations are so coming at you so fast and furious that you don't have time to sit down with the resident. So overregulation is a problem. Our approach to care improvement and long-term care is punitive. In Australia, they have an approach where they'll support you. So if you have problems meeting certain quality uh, indicators uh, in long-term care, you basically have an organization like Long-Term Care Whisperers who are gonna come and work with you to help you improve things. Here, we basically send out citations and the citations have very tight timelines. And when you work in a long-term care home where there's citations, everything else stops. Uh, the focus on quality improvement is diverted to that citation. 
But the elephant in the room, and maybe it's not, but is staffing. So in Ontario, we currently have 2.75 hours a day, and the breakdown is, as you see, about 75% personal support workers, 18% RPNs, and 8% RNs. The long-term care staffing study that was published two years ago recommends a minimum of four hours a day of, of, of nursing, including PSWs, RPNs, and RNs. In the United States, there was a study done by the U.S. Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services in 2001. This was 21 years ago. And at that time, they rec recommended 4.1 hours minimum of care, right? And we know that in 21 years, residents are sicker and more complex. So even our Ontario recommendations from 220, 2020 of four hours a day is not as uh, is lower than that of the US recommendations from 21 years ago. And this is how it's broken down. And as you can see, over 50% of the costs are nursing and personal care. Uh, the rest of it is programming and services, certainly not enough therapy. The food costs, I don't know how anyone can live on 10 bucks a day, but anyway. And, and then you're left with about $65 per day being the resident's share of these costs for room and board, essentially. But again, gross under funding of staffing here. And, and we know from what happened in Peel, where they were some of the first to implement the butterfly approach, is that without adequate staffing, they got exhausted. And they were in this environment where they were trying to spend more time and, and emotional time is difficult. You know, some of these people are at the end of life and it's hard. And at the same time, we have all these regulations and this framework and we have less and less staffing and more and more part-time staffing and agency staffing and people are burning out. And really, if we don't address the staffing issue, we will not succeed in culture change. And just to finish off, maybe some broader considerations. It's hard to do research in long-term care. We just completed a clinical trial uh, during the pandemic um, and we, we didn't achieve our required sample size and it took three months, three years, it was very hard. Uh, but uh, looking at Pat Armstrong's report from three years ago for the city of Toronto, where they were looking at different uh, approaches to culture change, uh, this is one of their statements. This is the, the butterfly is what they were considering, and they were no peer-reviewed studies. Uh, another consideration is our approach of trying to retrofit the system. And I look at the butterfly consultant fees, they're very high. I mean, you can pay two PSWs with that amount of money per year. And, and the question of, of why do we have to fix uh, retroactively a problem which should be dealt with at the source in terms of training? Why aren't we training people in this way at all? Why do we have to wait for them to come out and, and get involved in the industry and then realize things aren't working well and then pay uh, consultants to try to help us fix things. Uh, many of the models that were reviewed by Armstrong focused mainly on people with dementia. And, and we saw that about 60% of long-term care residents have a diagnosis of, of dementia and many of them have mild cognitive impairment. But the focus on dementia comes at the expense of the fact that many of these people have disabilities and chronic medical illnesses that are in fact driving a higher mortality rate in these people and more hospitalizations. And I think the, the emphasis on emotion itself isn't as person-centered as we want because, and as we'll give with the, the example of the person that I saw that I'm talking about, is that if you think about dementia as the condition whereby uh, the inputs you are getting from your environment are affected and the interpretation is affected, but there's still an inherent logic to the way that people with dementia will, will exercise their, their activities. And I think if we focus primarily on, on emotions and security, we might dismiss the possibility of, of some sort of logic. And I cite our example 
as an example of that, um, the personal expression consultant that I work with went for a walk with this resident to see what was going on. And what was very obvious was this resident, by the time she reached the first room, was struggling for breath. And she was looking around for a place to sit. And there it was, it was a bed. And she would sit down. And so I was brought in to examine her and she had severe aortic valve disease and stage valve disease. You can't fix that, you can't operate, um, but that was what was going on. And, and so there was logic there, you know, basically she was not able to tell us she was short of breath or having chest pain, uh, but she was essentially responding to a sensation related to her heart disease uh, appropriately by sitting down to catch her breath. And so I think it's important to not forget that a lot of these actions aren't simply emotional responses, but they are logical responses to uh, some sense of discomfort or external threat. So it's very important to think about that. And we ended up moving her to a closer room and the problem was solved. And the, the psychotropic drug was discontinued. So, but even more broadly than that, We've constructed a healthcare system and an institutional congregate living system where the care you receive is tied to a specific living space. And so let's think about it. You know, if I were to develop dementia and maybe I had a stroke and I need some help with my personal support, home care in Ontario will give you up to 40 hours a month. And they will certainly be more than happy to help me with my bathing. And I might get some respite, but if my issue was I can't remember to take my pills and I need someone to remind me, home care is not going to do that for me. And, and in fact, because of that, I may have to sell my house if I don't have caregivers who can step in and go to a retirement home where I will have to pay for the nursing and the care support uh, in order to get my medications administered to me. And more broadly, you can't, one of the main pathways to becoming a nursing home resident is through a hospital. Uh, hospitals are not senior friendly. People are hospitalized and because the hospitals are not senior friendly, they become delirious, they become disabled. And, and we saw that in spades in the pandemic um, that they came in from the community and ended up requiring a nursing home. So why aren't we mandating hospitals to be senior friendly? And why aren't we supporting primary care models of care? You know, the Mint Memory Clinics were evaluated by the Ministry of Health itself, and they were shown to delay institutionalization by six months and save $20,000 per year per person seen. Um, you know, you can't end up in a nursing home if you are better supported in primary care and the hospitals uh, prevent delirium and, and decline. And so the whole system itself is essentially designed in many ways to funnel you into congregate living. And, and, and kudos to congregate living spaces and long-term care for wanting to do, to, to, to do culture change and do better by the resident. But really, we've got a problem with our entire healthcare system. And that's where this issue of choice is gone, right? Um, why do I have to go to a nursing home if I need 45 hours of home care per, per month? Because home care won't give me more than 40. Right? And you get about 80 hours in a nursing home. So if you need between 40 and 80, you're not going to get the home care that might keep you out of the nursing home. So there's no choice there. Likewise, for retirement homes, um, you are sort of railroaded in many ways into retirement homes because we don't support you in the home that you've already paid for. And so the whole system itself right, is not one of choice. It does not favor person-centered choices. It doesn't really value, as we get older, our goals and wishes. And while you know we will probably always need congregate living because some of us will develop needs that truly cannot be looked after effectively uh, elsewhere, I think the whole issue of culture change needs to be applied to the entire healthcare system rather than just long-term care. Because if all we do is focus on long-term care, we're actually missing 
the fact that a lot of the harm that is done to patients is done upstream. And this is an interesting website where you can look for care quality indicators for nursing homes across Canada. Uh, it's maintained by Kai Hai, and it's a very informative thing. And it's informative because what you won't see there is care quality for home care, primary care, and, and hospitals uh, in terms of senior friendly care. And again, we're focusing on the end of the journey, but if we don't have data on the upstream part, we're actually not doing people a good service. So I will end it now. Thank you, uh, Dr. Heckman, for uh, presenting to us today. You've given I us lots of my, my mouse does not move. Oh. <laughs> I'm not sure what to do. Uh -huh. Uh, it's okay where it is right now. We can see you if you can see okay. me. And um, I'm, I'm th again, thank you for, for your comments. I, I would like to just say a couple of things. And first of all, the chat box isn't necessarily working, I understand, but just post your questions in the Q&A box because that seems to be working. So please, uh, if any participants have questions or comments, please use the Q&A. The, the other thing is you mentioned about um, just a few things here that uh, kind of twigged me, and that was about the consultant fees for Butterfly. The good news is I understand you don't have to pay that uh, exorbitant amount now to get uh, uh, help from the Butterfly model. So that's good news. So uh, we talked with the owner of Meaningful Care Matters, and that's apparently not happening now. They kind of look at what your situation is, and they, they help you based on the needs of your home. Um, I definitely agree that system, system issues is a huge concern. And I guess my main concern about all this is that if we are not going to get up to four hours of direct care into de until December 2024, then certainly there's things that we can we can do up and for the next year, two years or so to, to help residents in long term care. I, you know, it seems to me that when you look at the greenhouse model and you look at what you've suggested that smaller units and better staff retention and increased costs, but lower hospital costs, uh, robust uh, to pandemics, lower COVID mortality and all the rest. It seems to me there should be a willingness to kind of look at that part of the system. And I don't know if you have suggestions as to how we can mobilize even governments and so on to just look at that part of the system to see what's happening elsewhere and the results as you said there's not much research yeah well there's the most is in the greenhouse and i think we we we, we talked to folks with interi across the world and and everyone noted that the smaller your homes were and the better the staffing model was the less the infection got in and and you know uh there's something there. Viruses love crowding and they love milling about and peeping com people coming in and out. And so uh, I think the greenhouse model, if we were to spend more on staffing as we should, then the greenhouse model is completely a no-brainer as far as I'm concerned. And I think the more important part is to say to people, we've invested in this infrastructure of these massive buildings. Um, I think architects are smart enough to look at how they might make neighborhoods smaller in these buildings. You know, ultimately we need to have the staffing, we need to have the ventilation, but my sense is rather than building 350 bed BMOS like they're doing at Humber Hospital, which is again, you know, the whole, the whole idea of building a massive nursing home right next to a hospital smells of let's decant people from the hospital to the nursing home, right? You come into the hospital and you get delirious and you go to the nursing home. It's very convenient for the system, but it ignores the lessons of things like the greenhouse model. Um, if you have small homes with consistent staffing, you don't need as much hospital beds and people don't get sick from not just COVID, but influenza and C. diff and Norwalk and every other bug that always comes into the hospital. So, you know, I don't know why they don't think about that. Um, I know there's a lot of lobby from the industry, uh, but even municipalities, I think, are, I think that's where the option is, is, is they should start looking at, at these forms of housing because they perhaps have more liberty. That said, you're not seeing municipalities going to build a lot of nursing homes because they cost a lot of money. 
I think we, perhaps the issue is more urban planning. If you're putting a subdivision somewhere or, or an apartment building, you know, how, how does a greenhouse model fit into that? And, and right. that, they're more part of the, uh, the city. Uh, we understand in Quebec, um, they're uh, going to start um, working towards implementing the greenhouse model for their government funded homes. Do you know uh, anything about what's going on in Quebec there? Have you seen anything written there? Um, we had some conversations with folks uh, before their election and since their election, nothing. So I don't know whether you know, there are lots of things being said. And now that they have the majority, I don't know whether they will follow through. Right. I, I think, you know, for those of us who've worked in healthcare and been around the system, there's absolutely no doubt it's better to care for someone in your own home because it's home like you're used to it. You have your family, you have a relationship with people in your home, with your friends and so on and so forth. And you don't want to give that up. There's no doubt. But there are some people that just can't manage. And we know that in dementia with caregivers, often they get ill before the person is finished at their end of life. So they have, have to have help. You said we, we are able to get 40 hours of home care a week, but I'm hard pressed to know anybody who's had that amount. In fact, I'm look, dealing with people now that are struggling to get two visits a week. So, yeah. you know, I, it would be wonderful if they got 40 hours a week, even that would be great. So, you know, can, can home care actually be fixed so that we don't need to have institutions? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Yeah, and, and you're right. You know, 40 hours is the theoretical maximum. Uh, you have to fight for it. Um, and, and, you know, what we, what we did in, in, when, when we implemented the inter -I community health assessment and community support services in Waterloo, Wellington, we did find something that was very interesting is that uh, there was a huge overlap in characteristics of people supported by community support services and those admitted to long-term care. Um, but of course, community support services are cheaper. And so, you know, the, the, the economics, I'm not sure where the number, the tipping point might be in terms of the maximum hours of home care that we should be able to offer in the community before it really becomes a money losing proposition when we, when we blow the budget, but I don't think we're even there at 40 hours. So it's probably less expensive to spend more money in home care and the costs, but home care is going to have to be integrated. So throwing money at home care doesn't fix it. Uh, we know that home care itself isn't really integrated with primary care. And so if the home care nurse comes in in Ontario to visit you at home, it's because you've gotten really sick and you have to go to the hospital. We've shown that. And so in that sense, home care isn't contributing to cost containment. But if the home care nurse or staff could proactively say so-and-so is developing COPD exacerbation and talk to the family doctor and treat it with steroids and antibiotics, then you've got a, a mechanism whereby home care and primary care are working more effectively together and preventing exacerbations of chronic disease, preventing hospitalizations, preventing the decline. So more money at home care and more money at long-term care is needed, but if we don't think of how these can work better together, uh, then we are wasting money. And ultimately, from my perspective as a consumer, I've paid for my house. My mortgage has been paid off. Uh, why do I have to sell it if I need help with my meds? All right. We have a question here for, about uh, long-term care residents and the ongoing pandemic and the shutdowns. We know in the first couple of waves, everybody, nobody was allowed in. Now with shutdowns, I believe the designated caregiver, one person has access when they go in. I think that's probably standard in Ontario. And is there anything else that can be done to make these situations less damaging to residents is the question. Well, there's a staffing issue, obviously. So more staff is better, but you know, I keep thinking about my dentist during the pandemic. I think the dentists were closed for three months and then they said, we need to open up again. And, and and has anyone heard of a massive outbreak of COVID related to dental offices? <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> right? and so masks work and screening works. And, and why did we kick out all the volunteers? Why did we kick out the caregivers? Right? If, if the dental offices, 
if, if there's any situation where you're going to get COVID is when you're staring into the mouth of someone uh, from 12 inches away and there were no outbreaks. So I, I think the infection control was overkill. It was important, but they, they, it was overkill. And as a result, residents were harmed and caregivers were harmed. And so I don't think we need to necessarily, they're not mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. we, we have a question here about um, how can we influence the Ontario ministry to focus on smaller environments? Um, you know, as you said, when they're building, you know, they could architecturally maybe design them better and the ventilation could be done at that point in time. But as we know, they don't. They just put up these massive 300 bed units with 32 beds to a floor a unit and it looks like a long hospital corridor and, and they haven't made any allowances for anything innovative in its architectural design. Mm -hmm. So how, how do we get the Ontario Ministry to kind of look at this and, and make a change? Do you have suggestions on that? That's a tough one. Um, and I think back to the election that we just had and the conversation essentially was very narrowly focused on the politics of ownership. Now, the ownership may have something to do with it, but ultimately you can't operate a nursing home in Ontario unless you have a license from the Ministry of Health. And but I didn't hear anything from the other parties about anything about long-term care or the healthcare system beyond ownership. And, and yeah, I've, you know, we've shown that there's an impact, but there's, there's bigger issues that could be fixed that need to be fixed. And so I don't know where the other parties are at. They're going to come into power at some point. And I think I'm not sure about this government being able to listen, um, but I think it's the other parties also have to start looking at a more realistic plan here rather than what they were talking about. Their plans were all, all of their plans were shoddy, honestly. Mm -hmm. uh, just to clear it up, when we're talking about 40 hours of home care, and that's for uh, for a week a or a month, a month. A month, yeah. You mentioned in your presentation about training, and we all know that's so important. And, and you, you started your presentation with the, the residents who had difficulty after lunch making it uh, to her room or wherever and went to the first available room you know training it's kind of interesting to use that because you know the obvious answer would be to take the resident to the washroom after after eating but i mean that's common sense it's logic and it's um intuitive whether you're a psw or rpn or whoever a volunteer whatever it, within the home and I just wonder sometimes if we're actually hiring for any emotional intelligence out there and whether they actually have the, you know, the idea of, of how to care for people and what's needed. Maybe the regulations are kind of so, so severe that they're not using their heads, so to speak, because they're too busy with regulations. I don't know. What do you think about that? Oh, totally. <laughs> okay. I, I, I study heart failure because it's an interesting disease, but it's also imminently manageable, but it's sort of that combination medical illness that comes with cognitive impairment that comes with unusual symptoms. And, and we monitor heart failure by checking people's weights because when their weight goes up fast, it's because they're retaining fluid. Um, but you, you regularly see people weighing residents two or three times a week. And you see for six weeks, the weight has gone up 15 kilos. And no one has tweaked to this. And I know they're not dumb, but I think it speaks to the environment being so pressured and task oriented that you just don't have time to think. I think that's a key part. Um, again, we need more staff, um, but it, it robs people of that intelligence. The other thing when we've tried to educate around that is, is, is in many ways as a physician, we have this thing called internship and residency where we basically spend as a geriatrician i spent five to six years seeing patients under the supervision of someone right um you know there is a caveat that i will pick up people's bad habits that way as well as the good ones but what i've seen with nurses and psws is they get none of that right they, they're basically thrown in and and you've got some tasks learn your tasks and they may get some training about about caring for someone with dementia, maybe, 
but um, the training is not commensurate anywhere with the medical issues. And these folks will get sick at some point, but they won't present with the typical symptoms in ways that a 55 year old white guy would, right? Which is how we're trained. You know, the symptoms are all about 55 year old men getting chest pain. Well, old people in nursing homes don't get chest pain. They just walk to the first available bed and sit down. Right? Mm -hmm. So when you, when you, I, the it was a PSW who I've worked with and, and she's learned a lot from me and I've learned a lot from her and we work very well together. So the whole notion of sharing care and, and interprofessional care is very critical here. Often the doctors and the nurses are uh, ships in the night and, and the specialists are nowhere to be found, right? But when you work in a nursing home in a shared care model where you go around with the team and you teach on the fly, people get good at it. Mm -hmm. It's, it's been proven that mentoring and on-the-spot training is really yeah. very beneficial. You, you talked about professionals a little bit, and I understand, well, it's been going on for years. There's very few geriatricians in Canada, aren't there? Certainly in Ontario. You're one of the few, aren't you, Dr. Heckman? There's a couple of hundred. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it, it's, yes, we need more. But I, I do challenge my, my colleagues to work in different ways. And so uh, there was, they were, my colleagues of mine at McMaster were doing a study on geriatricians working in long-term care homes and they had to abandon it because there was only one guy billing a lot and that was me. And, and ethics are that you cannot publish something where someone will be identifiable. <laughs> so so I, I took that as a compliment and as a, as a challenge. Um, to access a specialist in our healthcare system, and there's the you know another element of culture change, is you have to get sick enough to be referred, and then the family doctor will send me a note, and I will send the family doctor a note with no explanations on how to implement, and and that just doesn't work, right? So we've done some shared care work in primary care, in retirement homes, in long-term care, and guess what? We get better outcomes. Right. Right. I noticed that Anthony's joined us. I don't know if you'd like to say hello, Anthony, and, and introduce well, yourself. <laughs> thanks. Thank you very much. I, I've been here all along, just uh, had trouble getting getting going. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hackman, for, for all that insight. Uh, as you know, CARP, uh, led by our Ottawa chapter, is hoping to implement uh, or impress upon the policymakers uh, all of this information that, that we've heard from you and 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 the work that that Kathy and Marg and Claude Paul and the team have been doing uh, to to educate our members so that we can uh, put that political pressure to bear and and get that culture change that we're asking for. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I do appreciate it hearing from the front lines. Uh, myself not on the front lines, but uh, as a caregiver to aging parents and looking at the, the future of long-term care for, for them uh, and that making those choices uh, on home care, uh, investing uh, life savings into home care as option B or, or going that long-term care route when uh, it's a system that uh, frankly, uh, Ontarians or Canadians are embarrassed uh, to call our own. So mm -hmm. that's uh, that's something that uh, we continue to to advocate and fight for, and, and I wanted just to to say thank you and and let you know that uh, we hope to be that means for change. While you continue to, and you and your your colleagues in the system continue to provide service as as much and, and as well as possible, but I want you to know that there are thousands behind you looking to to help that change happen. Absolutely, and and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Anthony. It made Any me think. <laughs> Any further questions from anyone who's listening in? I have a question. Mm -hmm. Mark, so Dr. Heckman, we, um, we have been under the impression and using some stats that um, obviously don't align with yours. One of them um, that kind of struck me was you said that only 60% of residents in long-term care homes have some kind of dementia. The information we've been receiving for probably at least five years, maybe more, has been that that number is more like 80%. We've had that from the people in long-term care. We've had it from 
and possibly even the ministry from the Alzheimer's Society. So um, I'm not sure. So what? how do we get that right number? So it's 60% have a formal diagnosis that someone has done an assessment and said, thou, you have dementia. Uh, the, people, the proportion of people with significant cognitive impairment is about 80%. So in many ways, it speaks to the lack of recognition of the actual condition. And those numbers that you showed, I believe, were the ones that were from 20, 2009, 2010. Yeah. So yeah. it increases over that yeah. last decade for sure. Yeah. Okay, the, the, the one point I wanted to bring about, and based on the last provincial election and sort of the the left wing of the political spectrum fighting on the ownership model, CARP was, was clear that we didn't, we didn't have a, you know, a, a horse in the race on on who was providing the care, but the transformation was the most important part. And we looked to Quebec as an example where they don't have a for-profit model, and their outcomes were worse than Ontario's, uh, broadly speaking. So, so, so that that can be a concurrent fight for change, but with some practical solutions, but. The, it, the transformation, regardless of who's providing it and the funding and the staffing that goes along with it are, are what CARP is prioritizing versus the, the political fight on, over ownership. And, and I think that's, that's interesting. It, it just goes to show that there's more to it than the ownership. And um, moreover, I think you know, the costs of government for buying all of this stuff is going to be ridiculous. And then the government's gonna be stuck if we're having a philosophical question about what ought to, what should home care look like, and what happens if we could invest more money into home care to support people, but if you buy 700 nursing homes, you're stuck, and and you've got to pay for them, and that means less money for home care, and and I think what we've seen in Australia with their approach, which is a supportive approach in terms of helping people improve care, and that could include culture change models. Uh, linked to accreditation, a more supportive approach, everyone up their games, right? Public and uh, publicly owned for profit, not for profit. Um, I think the for profit question is really in the retirement home sector. And, and to me, that's the next bastion where we need to knock some sense into the system because I have residents who are admitted to the long term care home where I look after them and I sort of say, some of them I've said, but you are uh, right now, you're in a family health team. You have a nurse practitioner and two pharmacists and, and social workers, and I can see you there. Don't abandon that. You're going to get less care. But, you know, essentially the retirement homes are operating in this limbo where they have to hire nurses to look after people, um, mainly to sort of pick them up and few things and call the doctor, but mainly to send them to hospital. And you pay for that out of pocket as a resident and you actually get less connection with primary care. And really the question is, you know, should primary care be funded in a way that they can help look after retirement homes? I mean, you get less care, less primary care when you move to retirement. I, I need to kind of cut in here, and I'm sorry, the, the discussion is getting very interesting, and uh, I don't think we'll solve it in the next minute. So thank you so much, Dr. Heckman, and for all You're the welcome. participants who tuned in, um, I, we will try to post the PowerPoint. Are we allowed to do that, Dr. Heckman, post yeah, it to yeah. people? That would be great, and we encourage anyone listening to go to our website, www.changelongtermcarenow.ca, for any further information on models and emotion-based care. So once again, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for tuning in. So long. So long. Thank you.